All right. Uh, greetings, everybody. Welcome to January's Tech Policy Recess event, and we're going to get by the technicality there because today is a non-voting day. Uh, my name is Bill Rockwood. Today we're discussing blockchain, brokers, and Web3. Can Congress fix the infrastructure bill and grow the decentralized web? Before we get into the panel discussion, I want to note that this event is, is hosted in conjunction with both the Congressional Internet Caucus and the Congressional Blockchain Caucus and its co-chairs. For the uh, Congressional Blockchain Caucus, its co-chairs are Darren Soto, uh, Tom Emmer, uh, Bill Foster, and David Schweikert. For the Internet Caucus, the co-chairs are Congresswoman Anna Eshoo, Congressman Michael McCall, and on, on the House side. And on the Senate side, it's Senators Patrick Leahy and John Thune. Today, we wanted to catch up on some legislative language from the infrastructure bill that passed last session. The bill imposed new reporting requirements for certain cryptocurrency transactions. The legislation used a broad definition of the term brokers that could encompass miners, validators, and developers or wallets who are simply unable to comply with those recording requirements. When it was passed, many said the goal of preventing tax evasion should not come at the expense of stifling innovation in a nascent industry by imposing unworkable regulations. Today, we wanted to have some experts weigh in with a little more detail on the bill's impact on innovation and where we should go from here. Tim Warden from the Congressional Internet Caucus Academy will moderate the discussion and I will hand it off to him from here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Tim, let me hand it over to you. Thanks, Bill. And, and thanks, thanks to the Congressional Blockchain Caucus for co-hosting this with us. Um, as Bill said um, in his introduction, uh, again, my name is Tim Lorden. And in the introduction, this the goal of this particular conversation is to kind of look at kind of the unintended, un inadvertent consequences of the infrastructure bill um, revisions to some of the, the reporting requirements and language for brokers. And we wanted to kind of maybe flesh out a little bit more uh, what those impacts were. Bill just mentioned a few of them, um, but we wanted to go in a little more detail and kind of see if we can exp expose the kind of growing decentralized web ecosystem that is that goes far beyond uh, what cryptocurrencies into other software development and th things where a lot of folks are saying that this is the way the internet is going into more of a de decentralized fashion. You've heard that from uh, Jack Dorsey. You've heard that from Andreessen Horowitz. Um, and in fact, um, they had a Twitter spat about <laughs> this uh, recently. So we think it's kind of timely that we kind of just drill down a little bit more in detail on you know, what happened in the infrastructure bill and we're getting close to some solutions that are coming online soon that'll kind of deal with some of those inadvertent consequences. But first, um, let me just go quickly to uh, you know, Jacob uh, Hampel um, from the Blockchain um, uh, 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 Association. Um, J Jacob, uh, can you just kind of explain kind of what... Um, what the what the intent, original intent of the legislation was, the broker edition, broker broker definition, uh, the change to the six hundred five zero I reporting requirements, the uh, IRS um, form, and then kind of what are the inadvertent impact of the actors in the space and, and how it how it affected them. Uh, hi, can everyone hear me? I froze there for a second. Oh, we hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, that, that was pretty uh, unfortunate timing. Uh, yeah, thanks for the um, introduction, Tim. Um, hi, uh, for, those of, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jacob Hample. Um, I work on uh, tax policy and government affairs um, at, for the Blockchain Association. And yeah, I think uh, to give a little, a, a brief overview of what happened with the um, infrastructure uh, debate, I think it's, um, it's, it, it's a decent case study in uh, what happens maybe when things kind of move too quickly without, um, I, I guess, a, a full picture into how uh, other, I guess, uh, connected areas will be impacted. Uh, so I think the it's fair to say the goal of the crypto provisions in the infrastructure bill uh, were, was to provide taxpayers with the information they need to easily and uh, quickly and efficiently pay their taxes. Um, the the way that a lot of other people uh, 
pay their taxes with uh, traditional securities when they get a 1099 form from uh, their stock brokerage, for instance. Uh, that's been a policy that's been very helpful for consumers. Uh, so they know their tax liability so that they're able to get everything squared away uh, come April and tax season. Um, uh, and the, as, an, as an industry, uh, we've been discussing uh, the steps that were going to be taken uh, to enact this, uh, this process with uh, the IRS and the Treasury Department um, for a while. Um, I think uh, as a lot of us are, are used to now uh, in Washington, though, sometimes um, when you have some of these like big bills, like uh, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, uh, where there's an opportunity to get um, some language passed, sometimes uh, there's kind of a, a rush to get as much language um, in there that might be um, like under consideration for various different policies um, as you can. Uh, and in what we ended up uh, ha uh, having in that, in, uh, in that circumstance was uh, some language that as crafted was not really tailored very effectively with, uh, with good definitions or, kind of, or I guess phraseology um, with how the blockchain system kind of functions as a whole. Um, and uh, you saw that there is uh, a lot of potential for uh, the, the provisions to apply to a large umbrella uh, to various different um, assets that happen to be uh, stored on a blockchain, but might not necessarily be um, the assets that uh, the people who were writing legislation might have uh, might have intended. Um, and uh, I guess the, where, where that is kind of now is that now that the, the legislation has passed, uh, the industry has been engaging with uh, the IRS and the Treasury Department as well to try to uh, get some more clarity on these issues. But I think it's still very important um, to keep uh, members of Congress and congressional staff informed about the, the progress of all of these discussions in case there is uh, some, some tweaking um, that's appropriate uh, in future legislation. All right, Jacob, that's great. It really sets the stage for kind of what happened, what the inadvertent consequences were. And then, you know, now we're going to maybe go, uh, go on as part of the discussion to kind of flesh that out a little bit. Um, and to do that, I wanted to welcome also um, Marta Belcher, who's the chair of the Filecoin Foundation. Um, she's also general counsel and head of policy at Protocol Labs and uh, special counsel for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And also Tim Massad, who's a research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School and an adjunct professor at Georgetown University Law School, which is right at the base of the of the hill. So, um, with with that said, Jacob laying out kind of the unintended consequences of the bill. Um, Marta, he's kind of like explaining that things things that were affected by the bill went far beyond cryptocurrencies and started affecting other actors in this kind of decentralized space. Now, we've seen a lot of discussion in in Washington even recently because. Uh, Twitter uh, and Block CEO Jack Dorsey um, has gotten a little bit of a Twitter uh, spat with uh, Mark Andreessen from Andreessen Horowitz on what Web3 is. Um, we've also had some interesting you know, pieces written by Mark C. Marlinspike, who is well known on the Hill and from the cybersecurity side about the uh, NFTs and the decentralized web, Web3. Um, there's been so much conversation since the infrastructure bill passed. Can you kind of explain what Web3 or the decentralized web is all about and, and how it fits into this piece? Of the puzzle? Sure, absolutely. Um, so, really, what we're talking about is uh, potentially the next generation of the internet. And I think the best way to think about uh, the problems that the decentralized web can solve is to really start with a look at today's internet and its vulnerabilities. So, today's internet is centralized. So, the vast majority of data that makes up the websites that Americans are using every day sits in data warehouses that are owned by just three companies Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. And so, when those companies suffer blackouts, vast swaths of the web go down for hours, including websites that are massive contributors to the American economy. We saw that just last month with an Amazon Web Services outage shutting down a, a bunch of online services critical to everyday life. Um, that's really the problem with having single points of failure. So why is that? Well, it's because on today's internet, if I were to go to a web page, that information is being retrieved from a particular server somewhere in the world, maybe very far away from me. So I'm going to a particular web page in a particular place and hoping it's still there. Um, so it's sort of like, imagine you just read a really great book in physical hard copy. And instead of telling your friend about the book by, by recommending it by its title, you say uh, it's in the New York Public Library on the third shelf from the left, five books over. 
Uh, so that's how today's internet works. So to, to see that book, you have to fly to New York and go to the public library and find the place on the shelf where that book is supposed to be. Um, but maybe it's not there or someone moved it or someone tore out the pages. Um, or maybe you get there and you realize you had that book in your backpack the whole time. So again, that's today's internet. And it makes a lot more sense to just tell your friend the name of the great book you just read and let your friend find that book by its name rather than its location. So that's really where the decentralized web comes in. It really allows you to have not just centralized places where uh, you have to go to, to get files, but rather a decentralized model, a better version of the web where you can combine the storage capacity and computing power on many individual devices spread out in like a supercomputer type network and store multiple copies of the data across those devices. Um, so this we think is the next generation of the internet. Um, and it's really designed to redistribute power online from centralized services to individual users. So on this decentralized web, multiple nodes can fail without the entire system falling apart. And the availability of information is not dependent on any one server or company. So it's really providing a much more robust uh, platform for humanity's most important information. And uh, on the D-Web, data is really distributed across the network and users can control their data and choose where and with whom to share it. Um, and so, you know, just to give you one example, um, the, the project I work on, uh, Filecoin, is a, a blockchain-based uh, decentralized storage network. Um, and, you know, we're, we're really using this decentralized web concept to store what we, what we call humanity's most important information. Just one example is the Starling Lab, which is a project of Stanford and USC, uses the Filecoin network to permanently preserve the USC Shoah Foundation's archive of 55,000 video testimonies of genocide survivors. Um, and it was also used to document election security in the 2020 US elections. Um, so this is just an example of how uh, having this more robust platform can ensure that humanity's important information can continue to be preserved into the future. Marta, that's great. And I really interesting. There's a whole evolving ecosystem that people really have, are not in Washington, not really paying attention to. It really feels like to us, um, the Congressional, as I maybe said at the beginning, the Congressional Internet Caucus Academy has been doing these briefings like pretty much every month since 1996, which is kind of insane. It's like 26 years or something. And when we started doing briefings on the Hill um, on these on the internet policy issues, um, a lot of folks were just like, this looks stupid. This internet thing is not going anywhere. Um, and we were kind of like, well, we think it has promise and you probably should start paying attention to it and, and thinking about it more critically when it comes to a policymaker uh, perspective. Um, I, we feel like the same thing is happening now with the decentralized web. Um, in 2022, that happened in like 1995, 1994, where people really weren't paying much attention to it and dismissing it as, as silly. Um, so thank you for that introduction um, of what the decentralized web is and some of those use cases are really fascinating. Um, Tim, let me, the other Tim, let me go to you. Um, when, when folks, when whoever wrote the legislation, and I don't actually happen to know whose fingerprints are on it. Uh, when they wrote, when they wrote this legislation, I assume they didn't, weren't trying to target anything other than, you know, people that are acting as brokers for cryptocurrencies, and they probably had no idea that this whole other ecosystem of software development and, and, and things were going on. Um, what do you think was their intent and, and how should they, how should this be a lesson for how they kind of think about regulation going forward? Well, thanks, Tim, for having me here. I, I think the objective was to ensure that there is tax compliance. In other words, that people do report gains from crypto, not simply that they get the information that they need. And, and really, I see this issue as the first chapter of what very well could be a recurring battle unless proponents of decentralized finance in particular embrace regulation and recognize that they need to embrace regulation in order for DeFi to grow and become truly mainstream. That is, I think we'll see this with know your customer requirements, with anti-money laundering requirements, with combating financial terrorism, and with general compliance with regulatory standards. And really the underlying issue here is that Proponents of DeFi, of decentralized finance, which you know is a collection of very exciting innovations that might uh, 
uh, replace or at least um, speed up uh, some traditional financial processes and institutions. They kind of can't have it both ways. On the one hand, you can't say DeFi can create a more democratic and inclusive financial system and uh, allow us not to have to rely on large trusted intermediaries like banks if DeFi can't perform all the functions that banks and other intermediaries perform. All those traditional finance intermediaries do these things. They do the tax compliance, they do AML, they do KYC. And you know, DeFi needs to come up with ways to do that. It's, it's otherwise, it's kind of like saying, you know, it's as if Tesla said, well, I can produce electric cars that go much faster on far less energy than traditional ones because I'm not going to put brakes in them. Yeah, that's true, but you know, we're going to have problems if you don't put brakes in the cars. DeFi has to come up with ways to do this. And, and you know, it's, it's not that it has to be done necessarily in the traditional ways. I mean, the ways that, that banks even have complied with various requirements have changed over the years. It used to be you had to you know, walk into a bank and show your driver's license if you wanted to cash a check. Uh, you don't have to do that anymore. Um, you don't have to do that even to open an account. Um, so I think you know, the burden is in part on DeFi and, and Congress really should put the burden on the proponents of the industry to come up with ways and not to hide behind the notion that, oh, it's DeFi, there's no entity operating this, therefore it can't be done. Um, the truth is there are some governance arrangements involved in, in any DeFi protocol. Uh, there are developers, uh, there are sometimes foundations uh, involved. Uh, there are people who have, you know, people who have governance tokens. And I'm not necessarily saying we put the burden on them, but I think we do have to come up with ways that DeFi, autonomous software protocols that are seeking to replace uh, traditional financial institutions or provide the same services can provide all the same compliance functions. I mean, look, Congress now requires antiquities dealers to do anti-money laundering, right? That was part of the uh, Anti-Money Money Laundering Act of 2020. So surely an industry as sophisticated as, as the crypto industry is can come up with ways to do this. I'd like to see it grow. I'd like to see it. I'd like to see us replace the market share of some of the centralized institutions in our financial sector. But it has to be done in a way where we still have compliance with the law. So yeah. let, me, let me just ask maybe um, uh, Jacob or Marta, um, you know, uh, Tim's making a good point. Um, but maybe kind of like flesh out a little bit, there are some people that do smart contracts and maybe software development on the decentralized web and web three um, or wallet providers. Can you kind of maybe flesh out like how, how, would, how would they know who they're dealing with and maybe help from a technical perspective a little bit, help, uh, help the audience understand that? Yeah, absolutely. The, um, and I think, I think uh, Tim brings up an excellent point. The, uh, yeah, and the, the purpose is not uh, to, uh, you know, in, in bringing attention to this in these issues, it's not necessarily to say some things are impossible, but it's rather to say, how, how do we make things possible? Like, how do we get, how do we start from a principled standpoint about what is needed and then look at the best way to do that moving forward? Um, we do see that with a lot of, um, uh, a, a, a lot of uh, development in the kind of, I guess, so-called reg tech uh, space um, within DeFi, for example. Um, these days, um, trying to leverage technology like zero knowledge proofs and other sort of um, uh, more advanced uh, encryption technologies in order to, you know, to, to verify um, people without um, compromising uh, consumers' privacy, right? Because uh, at the end of the day, when it comes to things like uh, any money laundering policy or uh, tax policy or any of the things where you need a or you need an identity, sometimes you don't literally need to know. Okay, this is Jacob who is transacting right here. 
um, in order to, to validate that I'm, uh, I'm allowed to, uh, you know, that I'm an American citizen. I've been, I've had all of my checks uh, done that I'm not involved in any sort of like a terrorist finance or anything like that. But you need to know for sure that I have checked all those boxes, even though you might not actually need to have a big data trove of everyone who's ever actually done it. And there are technologies that are um, that are uh, in development now um, and that are, I think, are, are real, really promising for these things, but it will take time. And those are the, these are the conversations we're having with um, regulators like the IRS, like FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, about what is the best way to get the best possible outcome um, for everyone involved and maybe uh, even uh, to uh, to find a system that would even have more applicability to legacy um, finance as well, that could help improve uh, AML compliance on that end as well. Because uh, as we know, like from the uh, um, the AML Act um, that Tim was mentioning mentioning earlier, there's a lot to be improved upon uh, with our current AML system too. So hopefully, that's a way we can move forward in a positive manner. And Marta, you know, when this legislation was passed and people started talking about what it would affect, and by the way, when it was when, when it was introduced, it was essentially written in stone um, as far as a process perspective, because no amendments were allowed um, on, on the legislation. It was essentially as immutable as uh, the blockchain. But when this was introduced and people started talking about the unintended implications or the inadvertent impl impacts of this, you know, how, how was it received, um, it, you know, at the Filecoin Foundation and Protocol Labs, you know, you guys are working on these public interest technologies. Um, and, you know, how, how did people feel about it over there? So, you know, so my, I have, I have multiple hats and, and one of my hats uh, is, is actually unrelated to protocol labs and the Falcon Foundation. Um, I'm also special counsel at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, and so there I focus on issues involving cryptocurrency and civil liberties. Um, and so for me, the infrastructure bill really was problematic um, from the perspective of civil liberties. Um, you know, the, uh, I think, I think the broker provision, there's, there's a lot been, that's been said about that. And there was a lot of attention on that. Um, but uh, even more important from a civil liberties perspective, in my view, is uh, section 6050I. Um, and so uh, section 6050I re requires businesses that receive more than $10,000 in cash in the course of conducting business to collect identity details of the person that's paying in cash and submit a report to the government about that transaction. And in some cases, cases fel failure to comply uh, can be a felony uh, and can, can carry uh, prison time. Um, and so uh, unfortunately the infrastructure bill expanded that provision to include anyone who in the course of conducting business receives over $10,000 in digital assets. And so that means that there are many participants in the cryptocurrency ecosystem from developers to traders, to miners, to end users um, that would be required to collect identity details of counterparties and report transactions to the government or potentially create, face criminal penalties. And so I think this really expands um, government surveillance of, of sensitive financial information um, in, including for transactions under $10,000 um, because of the way that blockchain technologies work, where if you actually learn the identity details associated with a particular wallet, you suddenly can see all transactions, even if they're, they're under $10,000. And so for me, it was something that really raised um, uh, Fourth Amendment concerns and I think is something that also is going to have unintended consequences for, for certain blockchain technologies. Um, you mentioned smart contracts. Um, I think that's one of the, the most important use cases of, of cryptocurrency is this idea that you can write programs for your money. You know, you could say for every second of a song that I play on my computer, automatically transfer one one millionth of a cent to the songwriter or the singer. Um, and when you're having those types of smart contract transactions, um, th this type of reporting requirement could really um, chill innovation um, in the space. So um, I, from a civil liberties perspective, the thing I'm most concerned about um, is, is both the broker provision, but also especially 6050i. Okay, great. I, I think that what we're looking at over here is also the public interest technology aspects of of what we're dealing with, not necessarily cryptocurrencies per se, but you know, where, where this is all going and how it affects you know, the promise of a more you know, private, uh, more privacy, more security, et cetera. So um, I, one I, there's one question from Marguerite in the, in the Q and A, um, and this kind of like say, maybe help us segue into, um, into the next kind of topic of conversation for today. Um, Marguerite asks, is blockchain safe enough to use, to distribute and manage 
uh, public assistance and benefits? Um, if so, could you provide info on an organization that is doing this? So it's public in, it's public assistance and benefits. I, I think this is kind of like a, a GovTech solution idea. Um, I know that in the past, the, you know, the administration had been looking into uh, blockchain technology. Um, I don't know if the Biden administration is starting that up again. If anybody knows that, the answer to that question, um, you know, let Marguerite know. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know of a specific company that's um, that, that's working on uh, things like that. I mean, it's I guess you know from like a, an intellectual like kind of like, uh, standpoint. Then yes, it is possible to use blockchains to do uh, lots of uh, verifications uh, to to make sure that anything is um, anything that is of value uh, was transferred at you know X time and have a have a shared ledger, have a shared um, I guess record of of all things like that. Um, I think over time we'll see more and more of these systems online with uh, with more, I guess, commercial uh, applicability um, to have uh, different um, different uses like uh, the one that uh, that Marguerite uh, outlined. Um, but as of right now, I, I think it's it's a little early um, in this, uh, I guess, in the development cycle for that to be kind of um, a, a regular use of a lot of um, uh, government services. Hey, Tim, if I can um, just respond to something that Marta said, um, she raised a concern on 6050i as it exists even prior to the infrastructure bill with uh, requiring you know, information when uh, someone receives $10,000 in cash. And now that's been expanded to uh, $10,000 in crypto. I mean, that's simply part of the framework that we have established to, uh, you know, prevent illicit activity. Uh, and, you know, banks have to file suspicious activity reports. Uh, there's all kinds of measures that we've developed over the years um, to address uh, the risk that cash is used for illegal activity, that financial institutions are used unwittingly as conduits for um, illegal activity or illicit activity. And you know that's the that's kind of what I'm saying that, that that regime needs to be extended to crypto in some way. Now, some people in the crypto community will say, "Well, yeah, we're fine with you know centralized institutions like Coinbase or Kraken or you know the centralized exchanges acting like brokers because they they kind of are brokers." I think that kind of gets the the issue. You know, we've kind of turned the issue upside down. It's not a question of who's a broker so much. It should be a question of how do we ensure compliance in the world of crypto with the basic you know, architecture that we already have to ensure know your customer, anti-money laundering, combating financial ter terrorism, as well as you know, general compliance with, with regulatory measures. Um, and I'm, I'm fine with developing new ways to do that. You know, I think, uh, Representative Foster, one of the chairs of the blockchain caucus, I think the other day in the crypto hearing, kind of made a suggestion that, that maybe there should just be a way that the government can identify the beneficial owner of a blockchain address. And so you don't have to have a whole complicated reporting scheme. Now, I doubt Marta would like that one, but you know, there, there may be other ways that we can get there. It's just that you know, I think we, we have to figure that out. Yeah, and, my, and Tim, my, my policy area is more internet policy um, over the past 25 years. But I do remember when the Know Your Customer legislation and, and regulations were introduced. Um, you know, th those are controversial at the time. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't like, yeah, everybody agrees it's something we should do. Um, it, it, there, were, there, were, there, was a, there was a big debate about uh, those issues. Um, and, and in the wake of 9-11, obviously, um, th there, was a, there was a national security imperative that maybe pushed that over the line. Um, but uh, but I, I see your point, I, Martin. I don't know if you want to respond to him, but I I, I think um, uh, I, if I if I could go to go to the next question, um, uh, Asad Ramzan Ali from uh, Congresswoman Anna uh, has a, a question that maybe will get us into a new new aspect of the conversation. The new I think we want to kind of finish with um, 
where, where does it all go from here, right? So maybe you know at some point we can talk about the the legislation on the Hill, what the Treasury potentially rulemaking. But at, first off, um, aside from Congresswoman Eshoo's office, um, who is the uh, co-chair of the Congressional Inner Caucus? Asked, you know, now that the infrastructure legislation is enacted, um, does the IRS have the statutory deference to be able to deal with these issues without congressional action? Does um, you know, Tim? I don't know if you can field that one or Jacob or Marta. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I would say that they obviously have some leeway in developing the, you know, regulations uh, as to how to interpret this. And if they, you know, conclude that um, the language uh, doesn't allow them what they think they need to get to a reasonable result, then, you know, I think it would be helpful for the IRS to come back to Congress and seek that. But, you know, presumably there can be even be some sort of public process um, um, in, involved around this where people can comment. Yeah, it, it, you know, deference has been in the news in the last 24 or 48 hours. I don't know if anybody has a different perspective on the deference that um, uh, the IRS will be given by the courts. Yeah, um, I, I can just say, um, like from a from an industry perspective, uh, you know, we're we've been in discussions with Treasury, the IRS, and with Congress about you know what the way forward for this would be. I think it's. You know, there's, I, I think the, like, the answer is there's going to be a little bit of both, right? I think there's certain things that um, that Treasury can do on their own that they do have the authority to address, um, but they might need um, some tweaks from uh, Congress too. And I think we're, you'll see that play out um, over the next uh, 12 months. And Marta, where do you see this going as far as like fixing, you know, maybe the problematic parts of of the legislation and you know what 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 things are coming down the pike in the next few months that um and how do you feel about those well there are a couple of bills um that have been introduced uh, to potentially fix this um one is uh, McHenry's bill um we also um have another bill from from Wyden and others and one from Cruz um and you know I think um some of the bills um like McHenry's bill for example um actually do address 6050i um, and others only address the broker provision. Um, so I think there is a lot of conversation to be had about, um, you know, addressing addressing these provisions um, and ideally addressing both of them, not not just one or the other. Um, a lot of discussions to be had, and I think it's great that the industry is having an opportunity to. Uh, engage with with this process um, because, as you mentioned, Tim, it was you know, uh, you know this was sort of a, an addition to a, a must pass bill that, um, and we didn't ultimately get any amendments in. So being able to engage with this process and and hopefully uh, amend it um, uh, would be would be useful. I think keying off of that, I'd say um, as far as process goes, right um, when it comes to legislation, I, I always view introduction of a bill as a starting point for a conversation. Um, <laughs> this really wasn't. Um, I know we're in strange times, but, um, you know, maybe, you know, for Tim and for Jacob, like, how do you, how do you view, like, when we start regulating in this space, which is all very new, I mean, we just mentioned about 10 different terms during this call that people probably need to go back and, and, and query to understand what they mean. Sure. Um, <laughs> what, well, what, yeah, what, I mean, there, I mean, comment on the well, process. Yeah, I mean, look, and, and I think there was appropriate kind of questioning about, boy, now finally Congress is going to you know, step in and regulate crypto on this. And, and obviously, this was driven by a desire to find a pay for for the infrastructure uh, measure. So that's what was really motivating it. So but, you know, that's sometimes how, how legislation comes about. Right. I mean, look, I, I, I would just say, um, you know, it. it we, we need to try to tackle this more kind of uh, uh, globally uh, or, or you know, in a, in a fulsome way where we really think about what are the objectives we're trying to obtain. And to Jacob's point earlier, I, I agree, there's probably better ways we can be doing anti-money laundering, you know, there, and there's probably a lot of stuff we're doing today in traditional finance that maybe, you know, isn't really worth it. Um, so, you know, we can, we can look at that. And, and frankly, I think, you know, blockchain presents some exciting new possibilities uh, in that regard, you know, in terms of just, you know, digital identities that might make K the KYC process a lot easier and faster and better. So, you know, we should, we should look at it that way rather than debating 
well, you know, uh, a centralized crypto exchange maybe is a broker, but a DeFi protocol isn't. So therefore we can't have tax compliance. You know, our tax compliance at the DeFi level is really up to the individual. Um, that's not, not the right way to approach it in my mind. We got to decide, you know, look, here are the objectives. How do we get there in a way that reasonably respects people's privacy, you know, minimizes the regulatory burden, but still gets us the result that, that we need? Yeah, I, I guess my question would be, you know, how, how much do we think that policymakers on, on the Hill, outside, of course, uh, present company, uh, the Blockchain Caucus, uh, uh, Congressman Soto and Congressman Ash, and the, the Internet Caucus, like Congressman Ann Ashu, how, how well do we think they're prepared sure. uh, to legislate in this space, not only just looking at the financial aspects of cryptocurrencies, but the entire emerging ecosystem of decentralized technologies that Marta laid out? There's no question that, that it would be better to have a lot of this done through you know, some sort of regulatory process where you can have notice and comment and have people really thinking about it clearly than trying to do it through legislation, which should be more about broad principles and you know, providing a, a authority and, and really some, some discretion to an administrative agency to develop uh, the necessary requirements. Let's hope that it, you know it moves in that direction. Marta, did you have a question? Yeah, response. Yeah, I, I well, I just wanted to add here, just just zooming out a little more because I think we we hadn't really covered this, but but we we you know um, Tim and I were going forth on um, KYC stuff just to make it super clear. Um, there, there is plenty of crypto. There's plenty of KYC already in the cryptocurrency space. So the on ramps and the off ramps where people are buying and selling and custodying cryptocurrency are are heavily regulated and are chartered banks or our trust companies or state licensed money transmitters and they have minimum capital requirements and they post bonds and they open their doors to yearly examinations and their financial institutions under the Bank Secrecy Act, right? And they register with FinCEN and they do KYC. So, so all of that is to say there, there, is, there is already quite a lot of, of regulation in this space. It's not like this is um, the first time, but I think really the question when we're thinking about the infrastructure bill is, you know, where do we wanna import uh, impose those reporting requirements? Um, do we want that? Which participants in the ecosystem do we want to put that on? And, and the issue here that I hope we can address is um, this question of whether that ends up falling on developers and traders and miners and end users um, and, and frankly, the technology itself. Um, so that's really, I think, the angle that um, I'm looking at the infrastructure build from. Yeah, and, and Marta, I, I would agree that, you know, on ramps and off ramps, centralized exchanges, clearly there's been a big push to, to do KYC at that level, and that's been very good. That's why I was distinguishing that from DeFi protocols. And all I'm saying is we can't just say DeFi protocols are off limits because they're not operated by an entity. Um, we got to find a way to make sure that the same type of compliance occurs there because otherwise the ecosystem, you know, I don't think the ecosystem will ultimately grow unless you do that, but you obviously can have illicit activity taking place. Uh, the bigger the ecosystem gets without it passing through one of those on ramps and off ramps where you might have a KYC check. Well, um, let, this is a complicated question for the panelists. <laughs> um, and and I, we, probably, we probably have to define like three terms um, within this question, but Dimitri asks, um, are any of you aware of progress made with regard to clarifying the, with the IRS to start treating staking rewards as property rather than income and making it taxed at the time of sale rather than time of when the staker gets ownership um, of these rewards? And maybe we should start off by saying, what is proof of stake versus proof of work? <laughs> I don't know how to answer that, but I leave it to you. You guys are the experts. Um, sure, I can, I, I can, I can take the, the proof of stake versus proof of work. Um, so the way that um, the Bitcoin works, for example, is through a, a proof of work uh, consensus mechanism, where a bunch of um, uh, computers, uh, generally, uh, generally called miners, um, compete to validate transactions. Um, and in order to prove that they are, uh, they're a legitimate part of the system, they have to show their work. You know, that's why it's called proof of work, that they show that they're actually participating in uh, in the way the network functions. Uh, proof of stake works a little bit differently. Um, I guess the best analogy uh, to use is that it 
uh, people kind of uh, bid for the rights to um, to do the validation. And the and the way that you bid is that you put in a, a stake. You put in uh, some of the tokens um, that you are talking about, um, uh, and then the the likelihood that you will be selected to do the validation and, and then be rewarded for doing the validation is proportional to the stake you put in. Um, so that's why it's called staking. People can um, contribute tokens that they hold uh, to be part of this process. Um, but then the, the there are some kind of complex uh, tax uh, considerations for that uh, based on the like dilutive effects of um, making ad additional tokens into these um, uh, into these networks, um, what that means for whether something would be uh, deemed a sale uh, while you're um, locking up your tokens as far as the staking process um, and all sorts of other questions. Uh, that is, uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a very clear answer uh, to Dimitri's question. Uh, it is still very much being decided um, in the court and at the re regulatory level um, as well. But that's you know one of the other just I guess a litany of issues that's going to have to be kind of thought about when we're thinking about um, these new systems. And it's definitely exciting from a policy perspective to be a part of because it's there's a new question every day about um, how things are going to fit into our regulatory system. But I, I guess um, to Tim's point, uh, I, you know, I don't think some of these things are impossible, right? It's just it's going to require some creative thinking and some optimizations to make sure that things are working well, both for consumers and the government and um, for technology providers that they can comply in an uh, easy and straightforward manner. Um, and then uh, Bill Rockwood from uh, Congressman Soto's office just put in the, the chat that um, uh, the Congressman, along with Congressman Emmer, um, um, asked for clarification on that letter, on that issue and um, has put that link in, in the chat. So you can refer to that as well. Um, and then lastly, when it comes to questions, I think we have a few more minutes if you guys bear with me. Um, this, <laughs> this question kind of, you know, prefaces um, kind of issues, uh, policy issues coming down the pike, which maybe um, we might want to just kind of, like, I'll ask you, um, is the prospect of takedown of unlawful content served from within the actual entries in the blockchain, various nodes, providers of useful practical access to actual nodes, such as Infura or Alchemy, um, a risk for the integrity of blockchain technology? Basically, I think that what they're asking is if they have to take down content on the blockchain, does it risk the integrity of the blockchain? And for and that's kind of a content moderation, trust and safety question, which actually I think the Trust and Safety Professional Association is planning an event on this um, in the coming months. <laughs> so anybody have any perspective on taking content down for the blockchain and whether that would, um, as, re as required in a trust and safety scheme, um, cause the, the integrity of the blockchain to be uh, compromised? It's a tough one. Again, yeah. <laughs> I think trust the Trust and Safety Professional Association, which are the people that actually do trust and safety in all the different companies, um, are looking at how do you do trust and safety um, on the decentralized web, and, and they're planning that for a couple of months from now. So maybe we should wait. <laughs> maybe we should just wait for that event. Um, yeah, I can I can add there. I, I think um, so. There's there's a difference between content that's actually on a blockchain, which is immutable, and then content that. Um, maybe interacts with blockchain technology, but is not actually on the blockchain, right? Um, and so um, I, I think that's sort of an important distinction um, because blockchain, the, the, the actual sort of transactions on the ledger um, cannot be changed after the fact because they are immutable. Um, but often when you have blockchain technology interacting, um, it's, it's uh, not actually, the data itself is not actually on the blockchain. Um, and so in that instance, you can do uh, content moderation in, in different ways. One of the ways you can do content moderation, um, of course, is, is this sort of centralized model that we're used to. Um, but another way you can do it is actually to have content moderation tools um, that, are, that are decentralized where content moderation is done on a node by node level. Um, there's, a, there's a company called Murmuration Labs um, that is working on this um, that basically builds content moderation tools for the decentralized web um, with the idea being that, that each node can make content moderation decisions and can subscribe to effectively like block lists um, that enable you to um, on a, on a um, uh, uh, sort of node by node level do content moderation. Um, so totally actually 
possible, possible, not only plausible, but possible to do content moderation on the decentralized web in a decentralized way. Um, and the fact that blockchain technology is immutable doesn't mean that the content that interacts with it always is. So I guess, I guess um, the, the point being um, is that these things are all new. Um, the questions are really new. The challenges are real, but nothing seems much nothing is potentially impossible when it comes to uh, building trust and safety into the decentralized web, doing appropriate reporting requirements, as Tim, Tim suggests. Um, and uh, maybe we should kind of leave it there with just a lot of challenges, a lot of work to do, um, and, uh, but nothing's impossible. So um, let, me just, let me just also say that this, this event was um, simulcast um, by the Internet Society, and we always appreciate that when they um, broadcast um, our events to the, the worldwide audience for the Internet Society. Um, and I want to, again, thank um, the Blockchain Caucus and the Congressional Internet Caucus, their co-chairs, um, and Bill, Bill Rockwood for doing uh, the introduction. And more, most importantly, I want to thank the experts that have come and lent their advice um, to this particular discussion series. Um, Jacob, Tim, and Marta, I, I really appreciate it. And um, I hope we can have you back because I think there's going to be a lot more issues coming down the pike. Sure. Thank you for having us. Thanks yeah, so absolutely. Much. All right. Thanks, everybody. And uh, look, look forward to the next Tech Policy Recess um, coming in, um, I guess it'd be February. So uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bill.